And now, Veep Thoughts by Kamala Harris. I'm going to share with you a very simple story, which is that I went home one day and I said, well, what's, why are conservatives bad, mommy? Because I thought we were supposed to conserve things. <laughs> I couldn't reconcile it. Now I can. <laughs> this has been Veep Thoughts by Kamala Harris. DoesMerch.com. Use the promo code Stu10. Save yourself 10%. If you're watching on YouTube, like the video right this moment. Subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell for notifications. Do all the good things that podcast listeners and viewers do. Glenn Beck is here to explain how Joe Biden is stripping away all of our energy freedoms. Sports and racism are back together in a wonderful coupling. I just love that. There's a new story about that one today. But we start by doing the shape of 2024. Yes, 2024, it's right around the corner. In fact, I hate to inform you of this. It's already here. Yeah, it is. Uh, in fact, I, was, <laughs> I love this story. A majority of voters say any 2024 GOP candidate would handle China better than Biden. They're not really specific about it. Just anyone else other than Joe Biden would be better than, you know, Joe Biden. And so Joe Biden is kind of getting into this race. He's got one challenger right now. It's Marianne Williamson, who I was looking at one of the, uh, the political you know, betting sites, investment sites, and uh, they have a list of all the candidates that might win the Democratic nomination. And I think Joe Biden is at 63% of the Democratic nomination. The guy's, he's all currently president. People are so sure he's around the corner from just you know, keeling over that they're thinking, oh, well, maybe it'll be somebody else. So 63% is really, really bad for a person who's already got the job. But then there's a bunch of other people listed, you know, people like Kamala Harris and Gavin Newsom, you know the names. And uh, nowhere on the list is Marianne Williamson. The, the only person who's actually in the race against Joe Biden isn't even listed as an, opportun- as an option uh, to choose. So that's kind of a sad start to your campaign. Now, look, Joe Biden knows he's bad, just like you know that Joe Biden is bad. And he's decided to try to spend the next couple of years convincing you he's not who he has been. He's not this incompetent fool. He's not an, uh, you know, slowly going or quickly going senile uh, old person. He's not a liberal. He's not a crazy leftist. He's, he's not who he has governed as over the past couple of years. The latest example of this is Biden upends politics. Precedent uh, in pivot on D.C. law. Yes, the president is in pivot. What's the D.C. law? Basically, it's this idea that, you know, um, D.C. can make up their, their own laws. They want to, you know, they're, of course, like def- wanting to defund the police. The problem is all these politicians live there. and They're like, wait a minute, what? I know we say that on the campaign trail all the time, but like we don't want it to actually happen here. That would be really bad. Uh, the GOP uh, led disapproval resolution is expected to easily pass in the Senate on Wednesday with ample Democratic support. But most House Democrats voted against it last month, arguing as they have for many years, that the District of Columbia should be able to govern itself. Basically, D.C. and the, you know, the federal government can control a lot of the things that go on in D.C. D.C. is trying to do all this to fund the police crap. The Democrats are like, well, of course we agree with it. Um, you know, we, are, we want this to happen. We want all this to go on. We want D.C. to be able to make all their own decisions. Republicans said, wait a minute, we don't want that to happen because we live here. and We'd rather not get shot. And so everyone expected that that dynamic was going to play out okay because at the end of the day, we all knew Joe Biden would step in with a veto. But this time he's decided not to do that. Democratic support for the resolution, which comes as murders have spiked over the number of years in D.C., is a shift for Biden. And his party could allow Congress to nullify the city's laws uh, through the disapproval process for the first time in more than three decades. We also have Biden uh, fueling tensions with Democrats by considering revival of detentions for migrant families. Wait a minute. What? 
Democratic lawmakers are furious with the laws that Biden may resume detentions uh, for migrant families, a policy they denounced as inhumane under the Trump administration. Biden lifted the detention policy shortly after taking office in 2021, but now officials are looking at ways to reinstate some of its provisions, stoking anger from Democrats who say Biden has been mum on his plans. Biden uh, announced he would not block the measure after 173 uh, Democrats uh, already had voted against it, prompting several lawmakers to accuse the president of reversing course without communicating his plans. Of course, you know, it's not a political win for them on, in Washington or on the border necessarily, at least for Democrats. But that's not really the plan. Joe Biden is out there to preserve Joe Biden. And if you remember correctly, the reason Joe Biden is your president uh, is largely because he was able to win the Democratic campaign by convincing people he was sane. He wasn't Bernie Sanders. He wasn't Donald Trump. No, no, he was the sane, moderate option. He just wanted a, a, a return to normality. Yes, a return to presidents of yore. And many of those presidents, like at their current age, like Woodrow Wilson today is basically the way that Joe Biden is governing. But of course, once he became actually the president of the United States, he took a severe leftward turn. He tried to present himself as this moderate, uh, but has gone off the rails to the left, passing you know, wish lists on the left that really they had never before even dreamt of actually uh, achieving. He just went for it. Even though he only had 50 senators, even though he squeaked out an election, even though he had the tiniest of margins in the House, he didn't care. He just kept going anyway. And now I guess we're supposed to forget about that. We're like now supposed to believe he's again a moderate now that we're getting close to campaign time again. Oh, he's standing up to his party. Oh, I tell you, he is. Oh, no, he's not going to let all these liberal things go through. He's going to stop them because he's the moderate. Remember, he's the adult in the room. Are you going to try to make us forget who you've been the last couple of years? Is that really something you're going to attempt? It's a little bizarre. Now, we're heading toward uh, the Republican primary, which is really the only one that actually matters at this point. Republicans are, we don't know what's gonna happen there. There's still a big question mark. On the Democratic side, health uh, aside, Joe Biden should easily be able to become, get that nomination once again. And we look like we're now increasingly getting toward a campaign, a primary, with a bunch of different GOP candidates. We have a few so far. We've talked to Vivek Ramaswamy on this program, Nikki Haley we talked to on radio, Donald Trump we've talked to on radio, Ron DeSantis we've talked to as well. Um, and by the way, the big Ron DeSantis podcast is coming out uh, in, to actually tomorrow if you're a Blaze TV subscriber, or Saturday if you are not, so don't miss out on that. And DeSantis, of course, not actually officially in the race yet. I don't know if John Bolton's in the race yet. I can't quite tell. He said it to like some reporter in England, but then I haven't heard word one about it since, so I think maybe he's in the race. I don't even know. But the bottom line is we're starting to see more and more people with the whispering. Uh, Glenn Youngkin is another one being thrown out there as a potential candidate. Tim Scott is another one. Uh, Sununu up in, uh, in New Hampshire is another. A bunch of people talking about whether they're going to run or not. Um, now, the issue, of course, is for many of these people, the reason they're running is because they don't want Donald Trump to be president again. And if they all get into the race, well, it's going to kind of dissolve their own defense here. Uh, Donald Trump took advantage, of course, in 2016 of a large field, was able to get the largest amount of vote, a, a plurality, in a lot of those states. And there was never really that opportunity for a one-on-one -on -one battle between him and another candidate. I mean, if you remember, the last candidate actually standing technically was John Kasich, who never had a prayer of winning the nomination, not even for one second, John. Not at one second did you have a chance. And you stayed in there all the way to the end. So if you are a person who wants Donald Trump to not be the nominee, you probably don't want a bunch of people getting in. Good luck with that. They're going to get in. The question is, will they pull out when they realize, like John Kasich, that they had no chance of actually winning? Uh, when they turn into Kasichs, it's time to get out, at least under this uh, theory. Now, we have what appears to be a two-man race right now between Donald Trump and Ron DeSantis, and that is kind of reality at this point. Could there be a third person who rises up and makes some noise? I think the answer to that is yes. In fact, I will be surprised if no one makes any noise at all. If none of these candidates have a good run, a good debate, something that bumps them into double digits. But really, I mean, Pence is the other one who, who at least can get to 8 to 10 percent in the polls. But does anyone really think Mike Pence is going to win this race? I, I don't think so. And I think there's a lot of people who say, well, wait a minute. 
we're so early, you don't really get anything out of these polls. And I think there's something to that. It's something to internalize. When you see a poll, especially between DeSantis and Trump, it's really hard to know what to take out of it. We've seen polls where Trump leads by 20 points. We've seen polls where DeSantis leads by 20 points. What does this actually mean? At this point, not a whole lot other than telling you that DeSantis and Trump are real possibilities to win this nomination. It's a story uh, from the New York Times a campaign. Wait, the campaign is halfway done? Now, it doesn't seem like it's halfway done. We don't even have all the people in it yet. We haven't held any primaries. When would you say the campaign is halfway done? I don't know, like April or May of next year, right? Well, no, not really, because so much of the work is done so early. The notion that the campaign is already at halftime is a little mind-bending, but if you reimagine a presidential campaign as everything a candidate will do to amass the support needed to win, it starts to make a little more sense. Most winning presidential primary candidates are built on support won long before the actual campaigning gets underway. I know this is, a, this is just something I get to see from the inside, but when people are running for president, they wind up getting in contact with Glenn a lot of times about a year early. <laughs> It's random conversations just pop up with Glenn Beck. Now, that's the only part of it I see. I assume the same thing's happening with Tucker Carlson and Sean Hannity and Mark Levin and, and so many others. But all of a sudden, these people who have never really you know, reached out, never really came on the show, they're all of a sudden very interested in what Glenn has to think about everything because they're trying to line up support for a run that they may or may not uh, take on. The leader in polls was conducted in the first quarter of the year before the primaries. That's where we are now has won the nomination more often than not in, mo in the modern primary era, leading back to the 1970s. Even when front runners lose, they often succumb to another candidate with significant support in the early polls. So what does this mean? Basically means if you're not showing up in the polls now, your odds of winning are pretty freaking low. Most candidates that win the nomination are already doing well in the polls right now. So you shouldn't necessarily think someone's going to jump into the polls the last minute and have a run. It has happened. Let me show you uh, basically every campaign we could, you know, they could track going back to uh, 1970. These are early national uh, polls, and this is a scatter plot uh, here, and I'll give you a, a chart, and I will give you this uh, to you uh, as much as, as I can describe it here for the podcast listeners. But if you see in the upper, if you look at the right-hand side of this chart, it's people who had good polling here early on, a year before. And the little orange circles there are the people who actually wound up winning the nomination. You see a lot of orange circles on the right-hand side of that chart, meaning they had early support. On the left-hand part of that chart, you see a couple of, uh, of orange circles, but a lot of the gray circles, which means losers, people who didn't wind up winning the nomination. To kind of give you a, a clearer picture of this, if you don't like uh, the fancy charts, we'll give you this one. And here's what this looked like. What were people polling at? in previous, uh, you know, about a year and a half before the election, where were they polling? Well, Clinton was at about 60%. She got the nomination. Gore in 2000 was about at 50%. He got the nomination. Dole, 96, he was at 45%. He got the nomination. Bush in 2000, about 43%. He got the nomination. Bush in 88, had about 41%. He got the nomination. Uh, Trump in 2024, this is where we are now, he's at 40%. In the polling average. Uh, Jimmy Carter back in 1980 was about 37%. Uh, Walter Mondale in 84, about 35%. Gerald Ford in 76 was still about 33%. Ron DeSantis in 2024, about 32%. About eight points behind Trump, but still significant early support. Neither one of these candidates would throw this theory off really at all. Ronald Reagan in 1980 was about at uh, 31%. Uh, Joe Biden in 2020 was about 30 percent. Uh, John McCain in 2008 was about 23 uh, percent. Obama in 2008 was at about 20 percent. Romney in 2012 was about 20 percent. And that's, you know, maybe the cutoff if you want to. Uh, maybe cut, cut it at double digits. Uh, John Kerry in 2004 was at about 13 or 14 percent. If you remember, of course, that's when Howard Dean was having a uh, had a major lead. And I remember thinking back of that Howard Dean campaign after that ended, thinking to myself, it seems so obvious that Her Howard Dean was going to win that race. And then he just didn't. And you realize that this stuff can turn around, so it can happen. There have been a lot of uh, examples. Donald Trump, of course, in 2016, at this point in the campaign, was only at 5%. He obviously wound up winning. Michael Dukakis was at about a 2% at this point in the campaign. He wound up winning the nomination. Uh, Bill Clinton in 1992 is another uh, one that throws this theory off. 
He's about 1 or 2 percent. And Jimmy Carter was really not even showing up in the polls in 1976 and wound up winning. Um, but this says something to the other candidates in the uh, dark orange there towards the bottom. People like Nikki Haley, Mike Pence, um, Sununu in uh, New Hampshire, Cheney, uh, which is obviously she has no chance of winning, Tim Scott, Pompeo, Romney. Romney, come on. Are they really polling Romney still? And Kasich. C- Kasich. Are they really polling Kasich still? You get the point. The bottom line is it, you can win the nomination, as Donald Trump showed back in 2016 and Bill Clinton showed in 1992, when you're not really on anyone's radar at this point. But the chances of you winning the nomination go up dramatically if you are showing up at this point. Sure, candidates do fall. One of the two candidates that is above uh, you know, 20, 30% right now is not going to win this nomination. I don't think they're going to you know, like get themselves attached and do a little Siamese twins type of thing running for the nomination. I think that's unlikely in this particular political context. So what are we looking at here? We are probably looking at a two-person race between Ron, uh, Ron DeSantis and Donald Trump, assuming Ron DeSantis gets in, which he's going to. And then you have maybe a third person who can kind of step up and challenge at some point, maybe make some noise. Maybe one of these two guys, uh, you know, winds up in a scandal and and fades away and leads to another opportunity for another candidate. But it is actually important to know and pay attention to this stuff. Now, everyone loves to bash polling. It's everybody's favorite thing to do. Everyone loves to say it sucks. Everyone loves to say they're smarter than it. I hear it all the time. Believe me. But And it's not perfect. It really isn't. You have to really understand what you're looking at and be able to put it in perspective, which so many people can't. And just the the bottom line is most people just freak out and they just, you know, spout out a bunch of, uh, you know, nonsense and then act smarter than everyone else and then wind up getting, you know, their their asses handed to them election after election with wrong predictions. This stuff happens all the time. The point is not to show show that this means anything serious or shows uh, anything um, uh, certain or anything concrete about the future. It doesn't. No poll can do that for you. But it can give you a sense as to where we stand. And it's not a surprise to tell you that Ron DeSantis and Donald Trump are the two candidates that very well might win. Uh, this particular uh, primary. It's, it's something that we all kind of inherently feel at this point. But if he gets in the race, if they're both in this race, this is going to be a dogfight. It's going to be incredible to watch. We'll make sure to, uh, to, uh, to cover it uh, as we go. And on radio as, as well, we'll be having the candidates on as much as we can. Because I think it's important to, to kind of be able to get you uh, the, the, the answers to the questions that you want. You know, we've gone through previous uh, campaigns where... You know, basically half the candidates hated our guts and didn't want to come on. We're going to try to get these people on as much as we can this time. Ask tough questions uh, and and try to help them get their message out to you and see who will win the Republican side of this race. Because I can tell you right now, Joe Biden's not the answer. And if we don't find somebody on the other side, you are going to uh, going to be dealing with, uh, you know, the sort of hell on earth we've had the last couple of years, which nobody seems to like. No one seems to be all that fired up for it. So we will see where we go as we go forward, and we'll keep you up to date as all the dozens and dozens of candidates jump into the race. We've been talking for a while about uh, a little uh, all-natural supplement uh, that you might be familiar with. Uh, this is going to help you with your liver. And, you know, if you need liver health, uh, you're going to have to make sure you get uh, this supplement called Liver Health Formula. Liver Health Formula works great to rejuvenate your liver, reignite your metabolism, burn fat, boost energy, and fight fatty liver that affects 100 million Americans. Well, the good folks over there put together a short presentation that shares four warning signs of a damaged or fatty liver. The warning sign uh, number two, uh, well, I mean, look, any warning sign of your liver is going to freak you out. None of my organs work right, so if you want to at least keep one of them working right, your liver. Uh, you can watch this free presentation and learn about these warning signs uh, at, uh, about your liver health right now at checkyourliver.com slash stew. Why not understand this? Why not learn it? Uh, checkyourliver.com slash stew. Check it out now. Checkyourliver.com slash stew. I'm joined now by Glenn Beck. Um, I told he's a radio host of sorts. Not exactly sure. His newest special is coming up on Blaze TV, though, 9 p.m. Eastern. It's Biden's secret war on our energy exposed. Be sure to stay tuned. I mean, he seems like he's really, really in favor of us making sure we have cheap, affordable energy. No? Is that not what you found? 
Not that we found. No. No, not what we found. Mm. Um, this actually came from a tip about four weeks ago, and we've been working on this, and we're just at just at the tip of the iceberg. This is something that the green energy people have been just foaming at the mouth to do. It was in the Build Back, uh, Build Back Better bill, but they decided to, uh, you know, not pass that because the American people weren't for it. Mm -hmm. And so, I remember that. yeah, so what they did instead is they took it, broke it up and, into little pieces and put it in a 3,000 uh, page bill and called it the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, which they are on record saying this act really is about green energy. Okay, it really is nothing to do with it, reducing inflation. Mm -hmm. So let's just take them at their word that, you know, they want to make green energy and they want America to be robust and strong. Sure. Okay. If you have to drive your car to work every day and work depends on you driving a car, okay, and you're a car builder mm -hmm. and it takes you four years to build a car from scratch and you have a car that works, do you sell that car and then begin to build another one? <laughs> or do you keep that car and drive it until you have the other one? Right. You want to make sure you have another option Why? ready to go. So Why? you can still make it to work. So right. you can still live your life. Okay. You don't want to go four Good. years without a car. Right. So if you care about America and you know that we have to have energy or people will die and America will crumble, you, you say, I want to do green energy but I'm going to build that and I'll gradually reduce the power plant until we get it up to here. You know, I'll right. just bring it like this. Might be a bad idea, but at least it's a, a plausible. Correct. Idea. And I'm going to keep that power plant um, in reserve just right. in case because it's cost billions to build. And it's reliable, unlike the other source of energy. <laughs> right. So I'm going to keep that just in case. All right. That's not what our government is doing. No. No, our government is incentivizing these uh, companies in many ways. I'll show you on the chalkboard today. It will blow your mind. What they're telling these energy companies, well, let me just tell you what they did in Canada during Trump. This is an American idea. Canada did it because Trump would not do it. But it's, we're doing it now. Mm -hmm. um, in Canada, they paid three power companies $1.36 billion to take their coal fire plants offline early. Then they paid them $97 million per year to keep them offline. So we're not paying for energy with this $1.36 no, billion. No, we're paying you not to create energy, but ours takes it a little step further. You don't get any of that money until you sell the power plant and for scrap metal or whatever, you have to retool, um, uh, reform, or destroy, sell off. Guess what power companies are choosing on doing? They're selling them off as scrap metal. So you're blocking the door to a return mm. if you don't have something. Right. By the way, um, you only really get this money is if you uh, replace it with uh, some sort of a hydrogen plant. Ah. Uh, okay. And hydrogen. How do you make hydrogen, Stu? I, you know, it's very difficult. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. You take water. Mm -hmm. Any problems with water? No. You take water. Any, you, know. you hit it with electricity, mm -hmm. and it splits it, and you get hydrogen. Currently. It takes more electricity to separate the H out of the 2O. Right. Okay? Mm -hmm. So it takes more electricity <laughs> than you get out of hydrogen. Mm -hmm. Okay? So Seems not... Seems like a really well thought out. Right. Mm -hmm. Unless you produce it in a nuclear power plant, then maybe, because you got all that... Juice, you could just keep it running at night. Nobody's using it, okay? Mm -hmm. Maybe you do it that way. 
But then there's another problem. Hydrogen tends to blow up. <laughs> Okay. That is a problem. It is a problem. Yeah. Um, you don't want to say, for instance, put it in a big Zeppelin. <laughs> Bad, Bad idea. idea. Mm -hmm. You could build a pipeline that oh. if anyone had attacks, it, it would blow up or it, it would cause all kinds of environmental damage, of course. And pipelines, nobody has a pipeline problem on their land, right? No, no, okay. no, no. So pipelines would be out. The other way you can ship it is by train. <laughs> oh, and okay. Mayor Pete's on the case on that right. one. So if you could make it, if you could make it, how are you going to ship it to burn it? That's how you get this money. You're, you're making hydrogen. Really? When did hydrogen become the big idea? I thought it was solar panels. I thought it was wind. No, no, hydrogen. It, one of my biggest problems with the Obama administration on day one was they canceled the hydrogen car from General Motors. General Motors wasn't building the Volt. They said electric cars are not the future. Hydrogen is the future. They canceled that. So all the car companies stopped making hydrogen-ready cars. When did they suddenly become interested in hydrogen <laughs> yeah, again? It's an interesting flip and there. And why would you, when you don't have the ability at this time to build a hydrogen plant, make hydrogen, ship it across the country, why would you pay for these power companies to take their coal fire plants offline so you can build a hydrogen plant. It's very, very strange. And it's like if, uh, if you remember the uh, great scientific paper, um, uh, Pave Paradise to put up a parking lot. Uh, <laughs> yes. At least, like, I'm not gonna give any, any uh, credit to those early environmentalists, but at least there was some coherent idea there where like we just de, you know, de-industrialize the world and we're gonna use less power and we're gonna save the planet. This is like we're going to insert millions and millions of electric cars in an environment in which we're turning electricity plants off. Yes. That doesn't make any sense. Those no, two things I, don't I, work together. I will tell you that this is, this is not stupidity. This is well thought out, well planned. They broke it apart. You know, what does the, the Department of Agriculture have billions of dollars to help retire some of these plants. Why does the USDA have that? Because they broke it up. They broke it up all through so nobody knew what they were putting in. And, you know, you, you, you can look at a lot of things and say, well, that's stupid. Do you know, mm -hmm. wait until I show you tonight what we're doing around the world. We're doing this with our money in different countries. We're paying countries, we're paying, I believe it's India. Is it India? We're, I'll show you tonight. We're paying countries to not ship coal to Europe. Which is something they need right now because we're in the middle of a war in Europe. We, th this is so Malthusian. Mm. And it's the first thing that I have seen. You know, you and I talk about this all the time. I hate when people call people traitors because that's very specific, yes, right. okay? Mm -hmm. This is sabotage of the American society. It is absolute sabotage. Well-planned, well-financed with your tax dollars. We already, studies I'll show you tonight, studies show we will have 26, we'll have a deficit of 26% of energy in the next few years, okay? That's, that's from now. That's not counting all of the stuff that we're growing. Gas stoves mm -hmm. got to be electric. Cars have to be electric. All of that. Plus, we'll be starting at a 26% deficit because of these power plants closing down. This is not just sabotage. I believe this is treason. Mm. There's no way that you can keep people alive and keep the United States of America, the United States of America with this power plan.
Mm. All right, we're gonna get into all the details tonight. And a solution. And At the end, we have a clear solution. One state has already done it. They just did it last week. So this Nobody, is not a, it's not coming up with, you know, some nuclear fusion that we haven't discovered yet. No. This is something that's no, doable? This is absolutely doable. Mm. One state did it. The next state, um, they're the two early states on almost everything ESG. Um, this one and uh, West Virginia is coming up next. And it needs to be passed in every state. What's funny is I know why those bills were passed. Nobody in the media knows. I read after the, this bill was passed, I read a story about it in the local paper. And they said, this is the dumbest thing ever. This isn't going to do anything. Yes, it is. It's going to preserve the power plant. You might shut it down, but you are not to dismantle it. That's the first step. Mm. Well, I didn't get to anything else on my card. Oh, okay, just sorry. talked about your special the entire time, but that's sorry. okay. Uh, it's Glenn Beck. The new special the card. is. You uh, don't have anything. On I that do card. right here. Oh, my gosh. I, I wanted to ask you about the Tucker Carlson interview. Can you give that's me really one good. minute on Tucker? Yeah, I mean, sure. you were in the middle of the of the Fox News uh, thing. Kind of what Tucker seems to be going through. Uh, Tucker and I have talked over the last few days. Mm. Yeah, I mean, super similar. We could finish each other's <laughs> sentence. I say the, I said to him yesterday. So when I was there. This blah, 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 blah. And he finished and said, oh, you no, know, that's, that's uh, yeah. <laughs> that's exactly I mean, it. it's, it's identical. They are doing everything they can from every angle to discredit and destroy him. And because, because he's on to the big truth, not the big lie, the big truth. Can, will he survive this? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Maybe not. I mean, I think at Fox, mm -hmm. but even not, if even it's not at Fox, I mean, uh, He'd be very powerful, most people don't, most people don't understand. And you watch the cable news numbers. No one's watching. Mm. No one is watching. Um, he has the biggest numbers, but we often times, uh, online, just one of our outlets will beat what they're doing, you know, daytime. Sure. I mean, it, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy what's happened. He would be able to leave there and uh, do quite well. Mm. His right. voice won't be silenced. Mm. Glenn Beck, uh, the special is called Biden's Secret War on Our Energy Exposed. It's coming up next, 9 p.m. Eastern. Make sure to subscribe, blazetv.com slash do. Help support investigations like the one Glenn is doing here. It's an important one. Uh, use the promo code STU and you'll save 10 bucks. Glenn, thanks for coming on. Thank you. Let me tell you about uh, GenuCell and their incredible line of skin care products. GenuCell's most popular package has everything for all of your skin care needs. We're talking uh, wrinkles, the dark spots, the skin redness, sagging jawline, dark circles, even the annoying bags and puffiness under your eyes. And with its immediate effects, see results in less than 12 hours or your money back. You got nothing to risk here. Why not uh, check it out? Especially if you got a great gift. It's a, if you want to get a gift for someone, this is a great gift. Uh, you can try GenuCell's most popular package. It's 70% off right now at GenuCell.com. For a limited time, they've got the probiotic extract moisturizer included for a visibly clearer and younger looking skin. Can, can they help me with my face? Well, I don't think anything can help with your face. I'm sorry, Glenn. I, uh, I mean, just science just says no. <laughs> they've just cut my holes in my face again. You, you should ask them to stop doing that. You, yeah, you, I have. Okay, okay. I did yesterday. Mm -hmm, yeah. How, how, can you stop? How? Uh, yeah. Are you okay? You're going to make it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's just, I, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest, mm -hmm. and as a kid, we never used sunscreen. No. And burn my face, and I tend to burn, never tan. And so, doctor's like, I'm going to be removing skin cancer from your face uh. until there is no more skin on your face. I'm like, okay. That, that sounds okay. lovely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You should maybe like eh, cancel some appointments. Well, he said, like, yeah. there, was a, there was one yesterday who said, oh, we got to watch this. And it's my eyebrow. And I'm like, you cannot take my <laughs> eyebrow. <laughs> well, only, as long as you have one left, you should be fine. Right. Right? You just need right. one brow. We need more than one. Look. I'm surprised. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, go to JennyCell.com slash stew. JennyCell.com slash stew for a limited time. Any subscription order includes a free beauty box and a free concierge uh, as well with the shipping. Uh, it's JennyCell.com slash stew. G-E-N-U-C-E-L.com slash stew.
You know, one of the really disturbing things I feel like uh, our society has developed lately is this sort of casual use of flippant racism. It's, if you got something you want to blame, just throw it out there and just say it's a, somebody's skin color, judge an entire group of people based on their skin color, and just assign that blame because that's seemingly okay now. I really thought we were trying to get away from that. I thought that was the opposite of what we were trying to do. I don't know, my whole life I thought you were supposed to not judge people by the content, or judge people by the color of their skin, and instead judge them by the content of their character, or their merit, or their abilities, or whatever the conversation is. You know, I saw this recently with uh, the actress Issa Rae, who was on, you know, one of these red carpets, and, and someone asked them who they're rooting for, and she just, like, flippantly said all the black people. She happens to be uh, black herself, and she's like, oh, I'm, I'm rooting for all the black people to win. And it's like... Like, just change the word. If you go up to a white person, you might have to Jim Carrey. You're like, hey, Jim, who are you rooting for? And they're like, oh, I'm rooting for all the white people. That would be weird, right? Like, wouldn't that be a... Wouldn't that be... I mean, maybe Jim Carrey would say something weird like that, but it would be strange. I think it would be something we'd notice. You don't seem to notice it uh, going the other way. And we've gone, uh, you know, uh, trying to solve a past racism problem. You can't solve that with current racism. That's not the right way to do this, okay? Um, and we're seeing this a lot. Um, we've even seen it now in sports. And here's a clip. This is from ESPN's uh, first take. And uh, just kind of this flippant idea that everybody around you is racist, and that's what explains the world. It's sort of this, like, uh, you know, a constant thing to go to no matter what the question is. Here's an example of it. And J.J. Redick, who's uh, trying to kind of shoot the idea down. Say, I want to just say something. Beck gives Stephen, a, I, I mean, uh, Stephen A., I mean, I mean no offense to you, and I mean no offense to First Take, because I think this show is extremely valuable. It is an honor to be on this desk every day. It really is. But what we've just witnessed is the problem with this show, where we create narratives that do not exist in reality. The implication, what you are implying, that the white voters that vote on NBA are racist, that are, they, they favor white people. You I just not, said that. I you just, not, yes, you did. I yes, did you did. Not, I did. Yes, you did. That is exactly what you implied, Kendrick Perkins. That is exactly what you implied. Secondly, I did not, hold on, did, hold on. I did not call. I stated the facts. I stated the facts. And you're not about to sit up. We all know what you implied the other day. We all know what you implied just now. Hold on. I stated it. It's the facts. It's the facts. It's the facts. All right, enough, enough. First, the show's not that important. Don't, don't. You don't really. But I mean, and who could watch who could watch them scream at each other like that? But the point of uh, Kendrick Perkins, who is the, the gentleman on, on the right of the screen there, was that uh, that a bunch of uh, NBA MVPs uh, who had didn't have super high scoring averages were white. And I'll t- you know, we all know what that means, which was the way he put it, I believe. Now, look. There have been like three white MVPs going back 30 years in the NBA. (laughs) Like, this is a country in which 12% of the population is African American, and they win the MVP like every year, with the exception of just a couple Dirk Nowitzki, Steve Nash, and Nikola Jokic. All of which, by the way, are not even Americans. They came from other places, uh, at least originally. Um, I I think Nash is Canadian, I think, right? Anyway, the, the bottom line is. How absurd is this? You have a country where 12% of the population is African-American. They win, what, 90% of the MVP awards? Yet that's still racism. Everything is racist. We've got a song that proves it. Everything is racist all the time, and it's not something that helps society. It's something that doesn't help racism. Actually looking at these things with some sort of intellect and sober thought will get you to a place where you can judge people on merit and, and, and forget about all this nonsense. The world is not supposed to be about skin color. That's the world we were all supposed to be striving for. And instead, we've derailed into this freaking apocalypse where the only thing anyone ever wants to speak of is the color of someone's skin. That should stop if we want to go forward in a more sane manner. When we first moved down to Texas, uh, one of the big, the, the, the terrible moments of the move to Texas 
was my wife's big plant. I don't know. She had some giant tree that she had in her in our little like room where there's a bunch of windows and the thing grew all the way to the ceiling and it was like torture for her to get rid of this plant. It wasn't going to make it on the whole trip on the move and she really had to just give it away and she hated that. And she was just talking the other day about like how she wanted to get a new one and, and get this thing to grow again. And I was like, you know where we should go? Fastgrowingtrees.com. Yeah, it's time to breathe some life in your own backyard this spring with fastgrowingtrees.com or your own uh, your own house. We got a fig tree or something. I don't know what kind of tree it is. She picked it out, but it's going to grow nice and big and it's a great looking tree and it's fastgrowingtrees.com. They can help you plant your dream garden with expert advice, fast, reliable shipping. It's fastgrowingtrees.com. They get the plant experts to curate thousands of easy to grow plants, shrubs, and trees, things that will actually fit your climate. You're going to get something that's going to die the second it gets a little bit too cold. They got stuff from like Meyer lemons to evergreens and everything in between. Your home is going to look amazing and you might get something delicious out of it at the same time. Happy plants make a happy home. So, you know, sometimes I will say sometimes I don't know what to do with this stuff. I don't have a green thumb, but don't worry about that. Fastgrowingtrees.com. They know what they're doing. They'll get custom, you'll get customized recommendations based on your specific needs. Plus, their plant experts are always there to help you if you need them. Go to fastgrowingtrees.com. Get the 30-day alive and thrive guarantee. That's right. If you kill it in the, like 28 days in, don't worry about it. Uh, you'll know everything is going to look great right out of the box. Join 1.5 million happy Fast Growing Trees customers. Go to fastgrowingtrees.com slash stew right now. Get 15% off your entire order. It's fastgrowingtrees.com slash stew for 15% off. An asteroid uh, the size of 112 camels is due to pass the Earth today. That's right. 112 camels. You should know it's not 113 camels or 111 camels. It's precisely 112 camels. They're not even rounding it off. It's not 110 camels or like around 100 camels. No, 112 camels. And I think the part of this story that's very bothersome, other than the fact that who knows if they're off by a few uh, miles, we, we may all die, is that there's no adjustment here for, to describe these camels as individuals. What if one was fat? What if one was a skinny camel? How many skinny camels would it be? We don't know because they're just treating every camel as if they're the exact same. We don't even know if some of those camels are actually biological hippopotami that are identifying as camels. None of this NASA will talk about and I think it's a grand conspiracy. So apparently a new app is being advertised on Facebook, and it's a deep fake app. <laughs> I don't know how this is allowed, but apparently they put Emma Watson's face on a woman who seemed to be at the very beginning of uh, an adult film uh, and uh, starting to simulate some of the things you might see in an adult film. Um, I don't know. I think she approved it. I'm pretty sure she didn't. They're trying to start to take the ads uh, down now, but it just shows you how crazy this technology is and what an awful, awful uh, development this is going to be as they can put anyone's face kind of on any video. Uh, that's not going to be very good. And, you know, they got like 16 trillion downloads of the app. Um, so uh, that's uh, showing what a great society are. And, and it's showing uh, you a little bigger piece of that. Uh, a little, um, little issue happened on a mountain recently. Um, a helicopter was dispatched to resort to covering up a lewd drawing. Now, it's lewd drawing. I wouldn't say it's lewd drawing. It was more of something that was someone... They skied a shape into a mountain, and if you kind of can see it from a distance... I'm not going to show you the exact thing, but it, it was a, It was somebody's... You know, it was just a big picture of a, a male... Um, a Johnson. So there's a Johnson on a mountain. And what do you do with that? I mean, I guess you could see it from the ground. They were worried about it. So they flew a freaking helicopter up there and they launched hella skiers out. So they'd ski down the mountain and cross out the giant phallic symbol on the mountain. Because that, you want to talk about a good quality use of resources. There you go. They got rid of the, the nasty drawing and it only cost a few thousand dollars. No big deal.